we on Boss Talk 101. Yeah, we gon' talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit lit. It's a unique hustle, big Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy, ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing official, Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Not none, you know, my dad walk on. I want y'all stop what you're doing right now. Go like, subscribe, follow us on all social media platforms. But most definitely our YouTube channel, okay? But only way you can become a member from your cell phone on our YouTube membership is just go on to any one of our interviews in the description section. There is a link. You click that link, takes you straight to where you can sign up to be a member. Thank you in advance and thank you for showing us love because we're going to keep doing this content every single day to give you what you love. Man, hey man, listen man, we got a special guest in here today y'all. He really don't need no introduction. Hey, Dirty South is what it's about. Who y'all got in here? Who y'all got man, in here? Man, stop playing, man. <laughs> Where's he at? Listen, man. Faison's in here? No, nah, man. <laughs> Burby's in here? No, nah, man. Toe Down's in the hold building, up, man. man. Hold up, hold up. South Side holding right now. Man, what's going on, man? Oh, man, just blessed by the best. Just happy to be in your presence. Man, you thank you so much, man. Love so, it. So, uh, appreciate y'all being here and having us on, man. Just ready to represent. Man, mm -hmm. hey, man, it always go down on Boss Talk 101 where the bosses talk, man. Let's get into his business a little bit. Just a little bit. So, born and raised Houston, Texas? Yeah, so um, my mom and dad, my dad's from uh, St. Martinsville, Louisiana. Oh. My mom is from Liberty, Texas. Okay. And I always tell people I'm Caucasian. <laughs> <laughs> my mama's white and my dad is Cajun. Oh, so, okay. uh, you know, yeah, first generation Texan. Uh, born and raised South Side Houston, Texas, right there on West Belford and Hillcroft. Went to Westbury High School. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, you know, left my footprint right there. What was it like growing up there as a young kid? And how many siblings do you have? I know you have a brother, but... So, I have two older brothers. Two one older is brothers. estranged. Uh, the other one is basically... Um, we make one good person. His name's Bernard. And he <laughs> wanted to make it up here so bad, but we had some real estate business back in H-Town to right. uh, handle. So he's handling that right now. So I have one other brother that uh, basically has been my babysitter, my manager, everything all wrapped in one. We've been business partners ever since, you know, we were hustling cars. How, how far apart in age? So we're four years apart. Four years. Yeah, my mom says she only had sex three times. Mm. So, and that was it. And that was it. She also and told all her, boys, all no bo girls. All boys. She also told everybody if I was the first child, I'd been the only child. <laughs> you that bad? <laughs> well, you know, when you have two kids, by the time you get to the third one, it's like, I'm just going to let that one do whatever he wants to do. Like, he wants caffeine and, and coffee in his bottle. I give him a... a, a, a a coffee bottle if he wants it and I remember being three or four years old and I had a Coca-Cola bottle and I had a, a, a coffee bottle with sugar and cream <laughs> and I was probably running a thousand miles an hour mm -hmm. running around playing my little Hot Wheels but uh, yeah so you know the thing is that I think parents do you have kids I don't. You Not know, yet. I've had a lot of practice but nobody would actually let me do that to them yet. <laughs> <laughs> no I think once we get older, we just have a lot more tolerance compared to our first. First one, you don't have no tolerance. And by the time you get to the third one, you're like, eh, it, it doesn't bother you no more. Well, there's That's a lot really of pressure on is. that first one, right? You got to set the example. You exactly. Know, my oldest brother, uh, he graduated summa cum laude, mm -hmm. 4.0. Wow. Uh, I was the first uh, uh, Terrio to bring home a D. I was so proud of it. I was like, I got a D. I'm like, no, dummy, it doesn't. That's not good. No, you want the higher grade. I'm like, oh, I thought I was being special. Uh, you know? yeah, yeah. Wow, man. So you, you, you something else, man. Like when I look at you and all the the, the culture that you got in you, man. H Town mm. is all around y'all. It's in you, man. It got to be in you. It can't just be on you, man. So well, that's what you know. Uh, screw. It, it wasn't just a form of music, right? It was something you immersed yourself in fully. It was a full body experience, you know, jamming that slowed melodic music. And, you know, whether if you like being sober or, or inebriated or whatever, uh, you really felt the music. It was slowed down to a, you know, a melodic waltz, if you would, you know, you know, especially with the chopping and the popping. And it was just something that, when you heard it, either you loved it or you hated it. How did you end up even, you know, the DJ screwed, I mean, just that whole uh, movement, how did you end up even in the midst of it and embracing it? So, what there was this place called Southwest Wholesale. Yeah, for sure. And they were right in our backyard. Okay. And oh, okay. so, uh, 
you know, I was with a group called Thugs of Another Kind. It was me and two other white guys. How okay. old were you? Um, this was right when I was 18. Okay. And I wanted to say we were going to be the NWA mm. of white guys, but <laughs> really you can't be NWA and be three white guys from the <laughs> suburbs. Like, what are you going to be mad at? Like, mom didn't give me my allowance this week, bro. <laughs> like, I can't go get my shoes. But no, on, you know, on the real. Uh, so we put out that one album, and that album didn't do well commercially, but we were able to sell 5,000 units out of the trunk of our car. Wow. Wow. Which led us to know that, hey, listen, if you hustle, you can make money on this. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, we were blessed to follow Kiki on tour. But who introduced me to Screw was Hawk. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I had met Hawk. Uh, and after, you know, the idea of the country rap tune came about, our first instant reaction was, well, we got to get Pimp C and Bun B on. Mm -hmm. Wow. But at that time, they had just got off a of big Pimpin. And, you know, Mama Monroe, she was all about her business and her babies were getting 25 a piece. And that just wasn't in my budget at that time. Right. I would more than happy have sold everything I had just to, you know, get them on a bar, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but at the time, it just wasn't in our budget. And so, you know, we respect Mama Monroe and Pimp and, and Bun. And the obvious next choice was Hawk. He just had that country draw. He, he spoke country. He talked country. He walked country. Uh, and so when we got Big Hawk on the song, he introduced me to basically everybody in the club, wow. like Pokey and DJ Screw and everybody. And so that's how the country rap tune ended up coming about. It was basically because of Hawk. So country rap tune, you know, you heard Pimp C say that. Was he, Did he say it before you guys or after you guys? So he's the one that indoctrinated the whole thing. This is his thing, right? I just got the blessing. All right. That was it. You know, I had a long, long, you know, sessions with pimp learning how to produce learning music theory from pimp c which is mind blowing you know here this guy was so talented at his craft he studied other greats like he would tell me about the beatles and how they would do a you know a a hook and then a short verse eight bars and then another hook and then another short verse he's like toe down don't do 16s no more you need to do 12s and eights bring back that hook back in and this was a guy that this was my run dmc you know mm -hmm. my brother grew up on run dmc i grew up on ugk right. it well, just, it's it's crazy that you say that because we just had bun on and bun said that when they did the uh the get throat he only let he only prepared for 12 bars when Jay-Z rapped. It makes sense when you say that. And then you look back at the Big Pimpin', Pimp C only did eight bars on that song. He, so you, what you're saying lines up with exactly with what he told you. And if you were in the industry at the time, and you got to hear the Bun B verse before Pimp got on it, Bun B actually had a longer verse on there, if I'm not mistaken. And I think Jay-Z went back and he added the Pamela Anderson Lee and all that after the Bun verse, right? Okay. Kind of, you go back and have to put another verse on this now. It's just it's just too much. <laughs> and then when Pimp C came on the song, it was just a rap. Pimp, Pimp, Pimp was the character and Bun was the... Uh, uh, vocalist, the uh, rapper. I'll put money on Bun B today against any rapper out there. Like Bun is my guy. When it comes, you put him against Jay Z all day long. All, wipe him off the floor. You put you him know, against wait a minute, wait a minute. You know floor. that. You know that. Not even close. Why, how do you feel? Okay, oh, so Jay Z. Tommy, okay, wait a minute. Tommy you got twenty five thousand dollars all day, and you and, and you got to bet your money on Jay Z or Bun B going into this booth to do a new creative song today. Who do you put that 25? Bun, all day. Why? Wow. You got to explain that to so, me. So we had one of the first all digital studios in Houston. This is circa 2000, 2001. Uh, Bun blessed me by doing an E40 record at my studio, which gave me one of my first gold records. Okay. I've seen Bun go rap a verse that he was featured on. The other guys had already laid their verses. After they hear Bun, hey, man, erase that. I need to go rewrite this. Multiple times. Wow. Multiple times. The way that Bun is able to articulate his vocabulary and words was just unseen and unprecedented back then and still today. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say about um, Scarface? Uh, Scar that's Cause there are a lot of people say that he's one of the best. So Scarface, I hold in a different light. Okay. I hold him as a founding father, okay. right? 
where Bun B was more of my, uh, I don't want to say my peer because he's not, you know, we're not that close, but uh, he was a lot closer to me than the Scarface music that I had grown up on. Mm -hmm. You know, Scarface, when you talk about Texas rap, Scarface is at the top mm -hmm. on almost everybody's list. Mm -hmm. But when I'm talking about just plain lyricists, Time and time again, consistency, consistency, a bun. I can't really make that argument with you because I'm so Texas. Like, I don't, I don't know, man. Uh, Scarface is is, is a he a storyteller. Bun is a, a lyricist. So you you're right. They they do rap two different types of rap, but face hard too, man. Don't get me wrong, Mary face Jane is face hard by, too, man. Mary Jane is still on my playlist to this day, right? Yeah. no doubt. But you go listen to Outcast Tough Guy, where he talks about call Tommy, I'm the I'm the Messiah. Just the way he flips that pattern and that cadence, the whole thing. Just I'll put that verse against anybody's verse. Like he's one of the coldest MCs out there. Man, I agree. I agree. When it comes to Bun B, man, like I said, I grew up on that. I'm a pimp C. That's my greatest of all time. It, it, and it don't matter about what you do. If he come in that room to rap with you, when Pimp C was doing it, and he he going it's gonna be something he gonna do that's gonna steal the show every time. And listen, though, I did you hear what I just said? He, you know, it, you may do whatever, just like when he pull up with the mink with with Jaden. He gonna always steal the show. TV ain't got no temperature. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly but he, what he's saying. He gonna always steal the show. So I definitely, I'm Pimp C, no matter. And what. And I'll still argue with somebody today that Atlanta's not the South because it's on East Coast time. Oh, you really go there? I go there because I support Pimp. I support Bun. It's what we do, you know? It might be a little cuckoo, but he had a logic to it. You're like, when you get off the plane, what time is it? Different time zone. What time is it? East Coast. Well, there you go. Wow. Right? It was just wow. one of those things that... That's crazy. You know, it was just what Pimp did. It was what Pimp... And Pimp taught so much. He was like, you know, you got... He was talking about females at the time. He was like... Wait a minute, stop right, right quick. Let me just say this. He said, we all know Atlanta is the South. He did say that, so he you did. can't just stop right there, you know. He knew that, because he said, I used to live in Atlanta. So when you think about it, he really just trying to do what it take to whip you in shape. The biggest thing that I got out of that when he was having that argument was the fact of how people don't tell about the bad side. They always tell about, you know, the money, and they were celebrating so much back then. Everything was about the movement of the money. Sure. They didn't tell about when you got busted, and your mama had to go to that prison and all that good stuff. We know about well, that. Well, Bun did say put everything in your mama's name. Put your cars in your crib and your mama's <laughs> mama, name. Mama, he did. You know, he, he did. did. He but did tell you. And listen, that was a blueprint for my brother and myself. You know, we, we really got an education from... Uh, his exposure to the street life, and it was that it was that blueprint, you know, um, and that was one of the things why we even started hustling and being in music in the first place. It was because of UGK. Like the first studio we recorded out of was uh, Bernie and Shatiro in Missouri City, and the whole reason we recorded out of there is because this uh, young little African mother, and uh, she was a co-producer on Tell Me Something Good, mm. and they recorded Tell Me Something Good. And when I told Bernard, hey, I know a studio where they recorded UGK at, we just went to just look to see if it was like a real deal thing. <laughs> like, y'all have a studio in Houston? Like, and it's not rap a lot? Like, where can I go and get in this place? Like, how do I get introduced to this lady named Bernie? Like, what's going on? And they ended up doing like South Park Mexican and a couple of other people that came up out of, you know, that area. But yeah, that was one of the whole reasons we even went to Bernie and Shatiro's was because they made a UGK record. Let's go wow. back to the Pimp C. I, I want to ask about this Pimp C, you meeting him the first time. Yeah, it was How, crazy. Like, like, where were y'all at? Let's go all so, the deep detail into that. Uh, I was on tour promoting the uh, album by prescription only. And my brother being my babysitter, AKA my manager, he gets a phone call from Mama Monroe. And she gets on the phone and she says, uh, you can call me mama, or you can call me Miss Monroe, but you can't call me by my first name. You're just not old enough, right? <laughs> you can't call me Wes. And that kind of set the tone with my brother. And she said, Chad wants to talk to your brother. Can he come by the condo? Wow. And at this time, he's telling me this. I think it's a prank call. I was like, all right, man, who's pulling your leg, right? Who's pulling your leg, right? So um, we get the directions and we go over to the condo and Miss Monroe opens the door and uh, we walk in the condo. Chad wasn't there. And she said, would y'all like to have a drink? Chad's on his way home. 
Uh, two and a half hours later, after being there, uh, we get a phone call. It's Chad. He's en route, but he wants me to go and look in his room, right? And I'm like, okay, this is kind of like, okay, what's up with this? Walk upstairs. I go into his room. And he says, look on the side of my bed. No, he said, look on my bed. And I was like, man, I see some nice sheets. And he was like, well, look on the side of my bed. And it was my by prescription only CD. Wow. And he was like, man, that boys in the hood is my jam. Banging UGK front, back, and side to side. Because white boys in your hood are also <laughs> cool. And he was like, that's my jam. And he was like, I'll be there in 30 minutes. When he walked in the door, we half, you know, dabbed up, took me right upstairs. We smoked. And it was just a, how much can I learn from this guy? In this period of time because i don't know when i'm gonna be back in this situation wow. right? this is like meeting elvis to me like the holy ground has opened up right wow and from that night on you know if there was a show he wanted us to ride in his limo if there was a, a place that we were going to be at we we're going to be with him if there's an opportunity to record a song i would follow him studio to studio until i had my opportunity to you know work with him and they were knocking out three songs a day because he was about to go get locked up mm. yeah and so that was my first experience of meeting chad pmc wow. and it was just you know i can only describe it as meeting you know they say never meet your idols never meet your idols you know they'll never measure up not only did pmc measure up it was like a blessing because the guy i was emulating which i truly was because i didn't have my own voice then uh was pimp c i wanted to be like pimp c and bun b those were my musical idols and when i was able to be with pimp and see how he does his stage performance the very first time we were with pimp c and he had a show he walked out on stage and he said fuck jay-z jay-z don't ride on blades and the music dropped what yeah. i was just I was like, whoa, like, where are we? Like, what's going on? Like, I'm like, you know, I'm the only white guy on stage now, and I'm <laughs> off to the side. Where was y'all at? Uh, we was in Houston on Richmond. Um, I can't remember the name of the club, but it used to be an old strip club that turned into a club and back into a strip club back and forth. I can't remember the name. I'm sure my brother would know the name because it's probably close to a restaurant. But anyway, yeah, it, that happened. That and happened. what did you think? What did you say? What was your, what was your mentality at that point? I was like, this is the greatest entertainer of my generation. What did the crowd say? What they were with him. Pimp, Pimp could walk into a room and it was his audience from the minute, from the word go. But what made him say that? It was, you know. The, I, was it the Tupac thing? Was it? I, I, I can't, I can't, just spec, had to, I can't yeah. speculate on what Pimp's thoughts were, but I know there was some things where like Bun B had did his part of the verse already okay. and they were waiting on Pimp C to do his part. And, and this was during that time. Yeah, and so I don't think that, well this was right after that time. He was he was actually performing uh, um, um, uh, Big Pimpin' and all that other stuff. But uh, there was some animosity between him and whether, you know, hey, Jay-Z don't fuck with Pac, like, and I really ride with Pac, and Pac's my guy. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard so them say it was, that. It was like, hey, listen, it, you know, he was going to set the tone. And he was like, Jay-Z don't ride on Blaze. And we were just like, whoa, what? Like, what happened here? Like where, like, where are we at, you know? But it was one of those things that he made that statement, and that's where he was, and that's where he stood at. Wow. Uh, but on the other hand, he has great relationships. Love with Jay. Jay. Yeah. Love him. Like Rock from, with him. Like, from what I understood, Jay picked Bun up in the Bentley, took him where he needed to go. They went and filmed, you know, on location. They did. They Chad did. went to Miami with his brand yeah, new band. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, the story goes, you know, he's wearing his mink. And I'm like, man, it's hot as shit out here. What you going to you wearing a mink, man? TV ain't got no temperature. And that's, that the, like that's the same pimp that said, fuck Jay-Z, Jay-Z don't ride on blades. Like, I'm like, all right. He know? just was, was you, do you feel like he just was, was uh, like, uh, what, do you feel like he was just, he just expressed himself how we felt at the moment? I think that just comes part of being a great entertainer. You don't wear anything, you know, you don't hold anything close to the vest. You just let it all out there. And I think that's just what he did. He just let it out. Wow. You know? So I wanted to go back to, you know, Growing up, when you are growing up and you, you're being introduced to this type of music, um, how many white boys you saw listening to this music and really following it the way how you were? 
So what was really unique about my situation is uh, we lived in a nice looking house, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the factor of that is my dad was unemployed. He got laid off from Coca-Cola when he was 55 years old. Nobody's hiring a 55 year old maintenance right. man. My mom was a stay at home mother. Mm -hmm. She, her job was taking care of the kids. And when I grew up, I knew what food stamps were. Mm -hmm. I knew what government cheese was. You know, we might have looked like we had a nice house, but we heated our house with our oven. Mm. I didn't understand that that was a, a poor quality until I went right. to school and somebody was capping on somebody about you so poor, you heat your house by the oven. I was like, wait a minute, that's what, you do. Wait, what are you talking about? You know, but at the time, I went to a predominantly black high school. Mm. You know, Westbury, we tease and we call it the future prison for, you know, inmates, right? Mm -hmm. But it was just a predominantly black school and a lot of the friends that I had were, were black, you know? And so for me to be in that situation, it was just what my surroundings were. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, I was trying to be black or want to be, I just enjoyed rap music. You know, my brother had listened to, you know, Run DMC, the Fat Boys, the Beastie Boys. That was all down his pipe, you know? When it came to my turn, I was, you know, listening to DJ Screw and Street Military and UGK. And that was my music, 3-2, that was my music. You know, so did growing, people say you wanted to be black? Yeah, did that's what I was like, to all the time. Yeah, all I'm, the time. I would figure that all the time. And you know, I wanted to do something to differentiate myself from the last white rapper. And at that time, it was Vanilla Ice who mm -hmm. left mm -hmm. who left a lot of bad taste in people's mouth. Mm -hmm. And you know, Eminem hadn't come out yet. And so, at the time of by prescription and Eminem. You know, DJ Screw and I had plans to be the Dre and Eminem of the South. Go on mm. tour with all that and do all the support and everything else like that. Unfortunately, um, he passed away and we weren't able to, you know, fulfill that dream. But when you grew up in that area, you didn't think twice about our skin color. We were just, we were just boys. We were, you know, homies or whatever. So nobody really you know, separated the black white thing until I started working the radio angle. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. now it's a different story. Now, right. does he get his record played because he's privileged? You know, what's going on with this, you know, type situation. And so, you know, you get a lot of reverse racism, reverse racism sometimes, not all the time, but we'd go to the National Black Programmers Convention. You know, we were the only white people there, you know, all the time. People always either thought we were the cops <laughs> or like, like, what those white guys doing over here? But you I know? had a question, but with you doing that and seeing so many things, do you agree with that term that um, because you are white, it gets you into certain doors when a black person might not be able to? Oh, totally. Totally. And listen, when it came down to the Fed case, I asked where my white privilege was at. I was like, you wait did a not. Yeah, I was serious because I'm told all the time, oh, you're good. Don't worry about no long sentence. Y'all, You guys are going to do 36 months. Y'all ain't, ain't got to worry about no time. Listen, sentencing came. I got four points for being a leader organizer. Two Wait, we're we going to go there, but I want to. I want to. I want to. <laughs> white go privilege did, but not, I wanna, did I, not exist. I did not exist. I it, was, it separated the poor and the rich, and that was it. And I didn't have enough money. Let me ask you okay, this. Okay, got it. When it came to your music, evading the N word, well, I've seen it. I, there's other guys that have come up on the scene that right. used the N word, and, and some, some of them, you know, regret doing it. And it was white guys, right? How do you open this? Uh, I Just don't know. Pull yeah. it down. Just, Just pull it down. down. Okay, there it is. So, um, what were your thoughts? How did you exclude? How, were you ever challenged with those facts of the N word, or did you ever people come at you wrong about that or around you, whether it was white or black? So you, it could be an all white crowd that so did. So even though I actually hold a card, right in the hood, I got my hood pass. <laughs> I don't use that word, right? That word uh, evokes. Uh, a lot of hatred, right? If I use that word, it's really bad, right? If we're in a surrounding and we're friends and you're using it towards me or whatever, I understand. But I will never ever say that. That word won't come out of my mouth in music or around friends. I don't own that word. I don't believe in that word. It's not something I grew up on. A lot of my friends were black growing up. 
And so that just wasn't even a thought. When How I hard is it, though? Because when you're listening to rap music, you hear that word thrown around that's a lot. that's the only word you can rhyme, you need to go get a rhyming dictionary and you need to go get you a vocabulary and come and see me. If that's the only two-syllable word you can think of, then you're in a bad situation. You need to get your game up. Yeah, I, like I said, I just, it was uh, I, other people that were doing it that were white. Um, and it caused a big friction. Um, and the thing is, is like, I get it, but I'm so old school. I could never, you know, I could never get on with that. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, I, I heard people saying, oh, he, be, he was around this or they've been around these type of people. And you just, you just said to the fact, no, nah, that still doesn't give you the right to do that. Not at all. Especially with the, what, with what everybody came through. And Jay-Z seemed to think we use it cause it takes the power away from, you know, cause I say it a lot, I ain't gonna lie to you. But at the end of the day, I feel some type of way, you know, when somebody that's not of color or, or even Hispanic, you know what I mean? Like I've been around and I'd be like, man, I, I should I stop using that word? Because I don't want, if I don't want to hear it, I shouldn't maybe even be saying it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So well, that's a good attitude to have, but this, but but the truth of the fact, it's part of the culture, yeah. right? It's how, it's how friends greet each other, right? Yeah. Is it wrong? Probably. But what you interpretate a word and what you think the meaning is, it's how you receive it, right? Exactly. How much power do you put into those words, right? Yeah. Some people don't like the word idiot or, you know, nowadays you'll, you, you can't retard say, it. You can't say retard or you can't say faggot, you know, mm -hmm. but growing up, those were just words we just used. There was no real meaning behind it. But nowadays you'll get canceled for it. You know, you said the N word or you did that. And it's a whole big blown out of proportion deal. Listen, mm -hmm. it's part of the rap culture. I don't use it. I don't prefer anybody, you know, listen, if you, if you use it in conversation, I'm not going to hold your feet to your fire and say, listen, I appreciate our friendship, but would you please stop using the N word around me? It offends me. Come on. You know, like get real. Right. But it's part of the culture. And that's what it is. Yeah, I I know I I I wanted Willie D to come on the show, and I heard him say, "Don't use that word." He was telling uh, somebody he was interviewing. I said, "Maybe that that's the reason I ain't got Willie D yet, because I say it a lot." That it was, you know, <laughs> I know, funny thing, I hate I I don't she like don't to like listen, it, but I, I, like, I say it a lot. Being from somewhere else where people don't really say that word a lot, right? And then to come here and hear, cause even when I came here and I heard people saying that black person or that white person, I'd be like, Shh, she didn't like it. Don't say that. It, it, but it's become a thing where people don't understand what you're saying unless you say that. You know what I mean? So it's like, not to say you, you adopt to it, but you know when and where to use it, so to say. But right. back in the days when, when George Jefferson and them, they would use all kind of words, him and, him and uh, Archie Bunker. You know? <laughs> That's right. And you couldn't even get those today. Yeah, you couldn't air those today. No. Like, no, they'd cancel you instantly. Like, for real, for real, for real. Archie Bunker, yeah, he would, he would get no play. Yeah, sorry, he gets no play. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, you know, there's friends, they use it in conversation. Conversation, you know, I, I just stay away from it. But I, I like I said, my thing is, I, I really and truly like uh, when I heard that uh, that that song with you, that country rap tunes, and you and Hawk, man. To be honest with you, man, that thing was jamming, man. I never knew you. I never even looked at. I just listened. I didn't even if I'd have knew you was in Texas doing it like that, I probably would have latched to it more. You Listen, know what I mean? You and half of America. I still remember to this date. I'd go on stage with Hawk. I let Hawk walk out first, and he'd do the hook, and I'd come out, and you could hear the entire audience gasp. <laughs> they were. It was like I would be in, you know, Louisiana, you know, and you walk out on stage, and the whole entire audience would go from a cheering to. A <gasps> And it was all in unison too, you know, and it was just a shock at the time because there wasn't a lot of white rappers out there, you know. There, there was, there was Vanilla Ice, and then there was Eminem, and mm -hmm. there was a guy named the Beastie Haystack. Boys. Well, there was the Beastie Boys, true that, but, but I'm talking about for like my generation, yeah, 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 yeah. and me upcoming, and for me to do a, a song called the country rap tune and getting the blessing from pimp it was just you know i was on cloud nine at that point i want to i just want to ask you about like um you know when you and hog did the song just let's walk up to the way it happened okay the way you and him you know met came up with the fact because i know you touched on a little bit but you didn't go into detail what happened in the studio how did this whole song come about and did you feel like it was a hit when you done it so uh funny story 
I, at the time, I was real heavy into selling weed. And I'm not saying I was the best in, in my area or Texas, but I was at least top five. Mm. I, I was good. I and was how really, old were you at that time? Uh, I was 20 years old at that time. Okay. Uh, at that time, I probably had about three or four years growing experience where I actually mm. grew it myself. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? And I knew if I, I could focus and make something that good that people enjoyed, it, it was a it was a hit. And that was basically my business card and my calling card. And for a long time, I would just trade people a sack for a track. Like, wow. hey, come in, get you a nice fat sack, drop a 16, I'll be your best friend, call me anytime you need something, boom. And that's the way a lot a of my- A track ride. for a sack. Mm -hmm. that's just Boy, you smart, you for your time. <laughs> Well, listen, you know, you have to, first of all, if you he want to. He had some, something that everybody wanted. If Exactly. And it was a great calling card. When I would walk into a programmer's office and I had my cologne on and they smoked and I knew they smoked, I knew I was getting the record played. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I knew it. Just how much? Do you want a quarter pound or a half pound? You want the whole pound? Let yeah, me know what you but want. But you're definitely going to play this. You're going to play it. And it depends on how many times you're going to play yeah, it. And you're not going to play it overnight <laughs> or none of that BS. I need daytime, mix show. I need all uh, that good stuff. I need the 50 plus spins a week to get wow. me up, you know, my numbers. Because what most people don't understand, being in Texas, you're blessed. The reason why is because you have two top 10 markets in Texas. You have Houston and you have Dallas. If you can get Houston on and Dallas on, game over. Mm -hmm. You can write your own check, right? Wow. And so my brother and I recognized that early on that, hey, listen, there's a core of guys here in Houston that consistently sell tens of thousands of records every time they drop. Fat Pat, ESG, Little Kiki, Hawk, Zero. So when I went to go do my album, South Park Mexican at the time, when I went to go do my album, See No to the Botany Boys, when I went to go do my album, these were all friends of mine because of the sack for a track type thing. And when you get something good, you let your homie know, That's you right. know? Mm -hmm. So when, you know, Hawk called up Pokey and, you know, Pokey called up Screw and how, you know, the story goes or whatever, I always got high recommendations, you know? So. My brother sent me to the studio to record a dance track. We wanted a dance track to get in the clubs, get the club pumping, up tempo, boom, 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 you know. And so on that za, going to the studio and my buddy Gris, um, he produced for, you know, Fifth Ward Boys, Scarface, all, you know, all the big rap a lot names. Uh, he said, um, I got this track I've been working on. Bow, 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 bow. And I was like, hold up. Play it back, and I wrote the hook, and within five or ten minutes, I was like, "Dirty South, what it's about? Pouring up, smoking out, keeping it hot like the middle of June. I'm just a Texas tycoon making country rap tunes. Man, it's just so melodic, right? <laughs> and it just fit in that groove. Just it was just the perfect marriage. And Grizz, he was like, man, this is it. This is it. And I was so scared to take it home to my brother because it was the total opposite. What y'all was, was talking slow, about? It was melodic and it was country. <laughs> and it was, you want to talk about some reverse racism. <laughs> I would take it to the country stations and they would laugh like it was a gimmick, like it was a joke, like it was a parody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just play it. I don't care what you think it is. Just, just play, play it. it. And they played it. And then the rap stations were just the opposite. Oh, Hawk and Pokey are on this. DJ Screw's endorsing this. Like, oh, hold up. What is this? You know, they're familiar from Pimp C saying country rap tunes. Here's a, here's the country rap tune. Uh, and so, you know, Pimp C wanted his own genre, the own, his own country rap genre. And so after recording the song or recording the hook, um, that's when we started trying to figure out who was going to be on the song. And that's when we, you know, tried to reach out to Pimp and, and, and Bun. And uh, that didn't work out, but it's okay. You know, they are well worth every penny plus more of that, yeah. right? But our budgets didn't reflect that. I mean, l we literally sold our studio equipment that we recorded the album to get the promotional budget to go promote the album. Wow. So after we finished recording the album, we sold the equipment in order to have the promotional budget to go push the record. Because even though Southwest Wholesale was in our backyard, they had never promoted a, promoted a white rapper before. They didn't know who to market it to. But see, at that time, 70% of all rap music was consumed by Caucasian. And like 65% of that was female. Mm -hmm. well, so the audience is white females, right? Well, what else to give somebody a sexy sex symbol like myself to go to a song, you know? <laughs> and so we knew that if we could market it to the right people, it would catch fire. And, you know, D 
DJ, he heard the song as we were mixing it at Digital Services and mastering it, and he said, what is that? And I said, it's my new song, Country Rap Tune. And he was like, get it to me ASAP. I'm going to the mixer meeting. He loved it. And I'm going to put it in. And we gonna, And I think within two weeks, it was in full mix rotation. Mm-hmm. Every DJ so loved the song. It was just, it was definitely, a, you know, a Texas anthem. And uh, I think it even crossed over to pop here in, in Dallas. But know? I want to hear but about. I want to hear about Hawk. I gotta get this Hawk part so out. So if you knew Hawk, Hawk was a gentle giant. Hawk, Hawk was the funniest, the most personal uh, person to be around. He would literally give you the shirt off his back. That was just his character. And so when it came down after Hawk laid his verse, he had laid such a good verse. I had written my verse at least 10 times, and it still wasn't what I wanted it to be. It, it was just, I was still trying to find my voice. I was still trying to work on my lyricism. I was still trying to work on my cadence, and I wasn't just put together yet. And, you know, after I seen how long Pokey was taken for the verse, I knew I had ample time to really sit down and, you know, write my verse. And Hawk, he was the one that introduced me to DJ Screw. First time meeting DJ Screw was because of Hawk. Hawk was the reason I was introduced to Pokey. Hawk was so basically. Hawk was over there getting them 12, them packs. <laughs> yeah, that's what he was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what Hawk was doing. Hawk was a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and listen, you know, uh, having people like Bun B come by and record or Killer Mike stop by or Lil Wayne doing his mixtapes at our studio. And wow. It was uh, a unique situation that my brother and I had developed in having one of the first all digital digital studios. Because once Screw passed away, there was really not a place for people on the South Side to go record. Okay. You know, although Screw wasn't offering studio time, there was not even a place for, you know, all Kiki or, you know, any of the ESG or anybody to really go record. And what was the name of the studio? We called it The Den, but everybody called it Toe Downs. I think oh, okay. Chameleon there mentioned in one of his raps against Mike Jones saying, that ain't your studio, that's Toe Downs, and that's on the <laughs> South. So, you know, it was always known as Toe Downs Spot, you know. Uh, but, you know, we provided two great services. One, I had an ear for music because I had learned from all of UGK's producers. I went and sought out Skip Holman, who was in Katy, Texas, who taught me how to engineer and produce. I could seek out these people. You know, I'd look on the back of the album, see who they were, look them up, go find them. Hey, do you know who this guy is? Can I get a studio session? And it took about a year before I could get a studio session with Skip Holman. But once I learned how to produce, and then I had the experience with Pimp, and I really understood music theory, everything just started coming together. And that's when we recorded. If you heard music come out of Texas between 2000 and like 2011, especially out of Houston, either we mixed it, recorded it, mastered it, or produced it. I mean, everything from Paul Wall's album to uh, Mike Jones' album. We recorded the uh, uh, Chameleon Air, Riding Dirt with the Bone part over at my studio. Uh, It was just a hot spot. You know, and we provided a good service, a great service with the studio, and we even provided a better service with the weed. Hey, what did what did uh, Pimp C think about country rap too? He he endorsed it. He is like, hey man, you know. You when he first heard it, what did he what did he say? Again, his jam was also cool, which was Correct. banging UG. But he 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 endorsed it. He said, "Toe down, run with it." And, and, and that was it. That was our conversation about it. It Pretty wasn't, brief. It wasn't you know, uh, you owe me this or you owe me that. It, it wasn't even like that. It was, um, he was Mr. Miyagi and I was learning. <laughs> yeah. And I was just all ears. And I was, you know, 2022 20, at the time. And uh, again, this is like meeting Elvis to me. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so the whole Hawk situation to round up the, you know, the story about the country rap tune, it was really Hawk and him recognizing Pokey would be a great addition to the song. Wow. And it was really Hawk who really introduced me to DJ Screw, and that's how I got involved. Wow, with this one. Okay, and and Hawk, when you think about Hawk, like, like when he passed away, I'm gonna skip to that, because I, I remember Mr. Lee was saying that he left his studio, I think I left him at the time, and then a little bit, little bit later, he, he, he you know, he, he, he got killed. Um, like, where were you at, and how did that affect you? Just going there for a second. Um, it affected me deeply because we were we weren't just you know studio friends you know this was somebody i i knew his wife i knew his kids um and it was the biggest hole in houston's legacy of music 
from him passing away because we don't get to enjoy his music because there's so much he still could have done. Like he was just started. He was just cooking, chilling with my broad and you already. Like no. that was just the beginning. Just Everything beginning. from like him blessing a uh, uh, little old with back, 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 back. Give, give me, me 50, 50 feet. feet. Yeah. I mean, come on, man. Like, so where were you at? Like, like what did you were you were at home? You were at the studio uh, and you heard about. I this. was at I was at the studio and I had heard that Hawk had passed away and I immediately just burst into tears because you knew it was real it, it was real it was real and you know there was this whole thing you know going around that the screwed up click is cursed and everybody's dying out of the click and you know at that time my appetite for drugs was just uh oh man 120 uh lord tabs a day i mean we're smoking an ounce of weed at a time if you got a a, a pint of drink we're gonna kill it in one session wow it was just that lifestyle that we were you know living you know and you know nobody thought that oh these pills i'm taking is basically heroin this this drink that i'm sipping on is basically heroin you know and you know when you're overweight, that complicates things. And when you live a lifestyle of this, you know, this type of lifestyle, things tend to happen. But in Hawk's situation, it was, well, was it a mis like mistaken identity? Yeah, that's like, what, that's what if they you were knew Hawk, Hawk didn't have that hate in his heart. Like that wasn't Hawk. That just wasn't him. You know, was it a, a robbery gone wrong? Was it mistaken identity? What what was it? You know, yeah. And I I mean, I spoke to both of his son Taj and Karan, and you know, we had uh, uh, Taj and I had a long talk. Um, I mean, an hour or two talking about uh, what he felt about his father, and you know how it was growing up, and you know he has a legacy to carry yeah. on because of his father and now he has opportunity and so i think hawk's time was cut short and not everybody got to really get to know hawk like i did which is it's just sad but i'm here to help promote his legacy and make sure his name stays alive and make sure the country rap tune gets played everywhere i go and so he was a type of dude that, like I said, would give his shirt off back to you. He he was just the most fun-loving guy to be on the road with. Uh, There's so many good times we had from filming the country rap tune video to being on tour. He was just one of the greatest guys to perform with. And when he came on stage, his hand would go up and the whole crowd's hand would go up. And it was just, wow. it was like watching a uh, a conductor at a symphony. You know? Did you when you when you when you and him? I mean, you knew him. When did you know him when his brother passed, Fat Pat? So, or you I met him after that? I met him after that. Did he ever talk to you about his brother? Uh, no, not much. Never did mention him. It wasn't. It wasn't. That I didn't mention him. Is that we just didn't talk about it? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't like, hey, well, you know, talking about Fat Pat. You yeah, know, because the music y'all were dealing with music. Right. The, you know, maybe remaking his brother's song or doing something with his brother's and, music. And I remember when Rex Shop brought the Fat Pat single to Club Oasis to break it for the first time. I'll never forget that day. I was with the group Thugs of Another Kind, and we were promoting out in the parking lot. And uh, Rex Shop showed up, Fat Pat showed up, and they dropped it in, a in Oasis. And Club Oasis at the time was like the hottest club in Houston for like hip hop and stuff. And the whole crowd went crazy. crazy. It was, it was just one of those things. When you heard Tops drop, it was, it was off. It was, it was off and running. Tops drop. Yeah. Man, you guys, man, that's something else, man. So. I just like I said, I, I I know you full of all the music, all the people, DJ Screw, um, you know, like like this little Kiki. I, I've interviewed Lil Kiki, man, but DJ Screw was one. I wish I could have got to meet him, man. Everybody tells stories about how, how dope he was and how his movement was, man. Great I mean, dude, great dude. Yeah, uh, Hawk calls him up and he says, hey, Tore Down was on his way. And that was the first time you that meet was him? the first time I met Screw, right? So I go knock on Screw's door and... The, uh, a gate and a screw open the door with an AK. Really? Well, it's just me and my brother. We're two white guys knocking on the door, right? You know, again, either you thought we were the police, you didn't expect Toe Down to be white, you know? <laughs> hey, man, I'm Toe Down. I'm Hawk sent me over here. Oh, come on in, Toe Down. And when you walked into Screw's room, there was just cr there was just records. There was no place to sit. You just stood there. You know, you were just in in the presence of greatness. Wow. And uh, the very first night I met Screw, 3-2 came by, and 
we all we we lit up the stick and we all got you know on that other level wow, <laughs> and wow. so that was my first time ever meeting dj screw so yeah. ever, ever since then we were as thick as thieves you know i was like hey screw i'm working on this project you know i got everybody on it i'd really like to get you on it i like for you to you know chop screw my record and he's like toe down i got you just bring me the records yeah well that creates a problem because when you, back then, when you're recording, right, and we're making CDs, he's not using CDs to work, right? He needs the vinyl. Well, that means we have to burn acetates or make acetates of each song wow. so he can screw it down, which is a lengthy process. I think each acetate back then was like 500 bucks. Ooh. You got 12 songs on a record. You got, you're, you're banging your head, but it's DJ Screw. So we recorded all his vocals for the interlude to the album and then we are gonna make the acetates and have them go chop and pop. And uh, unfortunately, by the time uh, by the time we got the acetates back, he had passed away. Wow, man, I, I I definitely loved his movement and everybody and everybody knew and loved DJ Scoop. Look, Kiki, his uh, just his they used his like like even Pimp C, they would use his 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 screwed down version on everything. I thought that was a big part of the movement in Houston, you know? L listen, I credit little Kiki till this day. If it wasn't for Kiki, I don't know if I'd ever been a rapper. Cause Kiki allowed us to follow him on tour. He had a manager mm -hmm. at the time, Patrick, and they were with Jam Down. And Patrick and my brother really had a bond. And we really learned from Kiki. We learned how to set up merchandise tables. We learned how to, you know, after you get off stage, go sit up at your table and meet and greet people and shake hands and kiss babies and sell merchandise. And we really got a lesson from Kiki on how to do all that stuff. It was following Kiki around. And you got to keep in mind, man, Kiki, Kiki can tour Texas alone, every city, a different date, 365. Sell it out. Every time. You know, uh, so being around a class act like that and seeing how somebody who's really motivated to get it and go get it, totally different story. Wow. What did you think when Kiki went over to uh, Swish House? <laughs> Man, you know, uh, if, if I got to be honest, you got to be honest. If I got to be honest, it was like uh, it was like your girlfriend telling you she, she cheated on you. Really? It hurt you. Because Kiki's the captain of the screwed up clique. Yeah, he's the man. He's the captain. Whether you want to admit it or not, or whatever it is, Kiki's the captain of the screwed up clique. That's he, it. Plain and simple. Wow. Four star, five star general, that's him. You know, and then for him to, you know, go to the other team, it's like when Babe Ruth got traded to Boston. Like, come that's on, cool. man. It was just, you know, you, you want to see him you know, you know, be with the screwed up click. But at the time, that was the vehicle to get him to a better position. So I respected the whole business move behind it. To be honest with you, when we did Paul Wall sitting sideways, it was Paul Wall, Pokey and Kiki. But Kiki hadn't signed yet to Swisher House. Really? So they took Kiki off and put another Paul Wall verse on there. So originally sitting sideways was well, that would have been wall. killer. How did it sound? Oh, I still got it. You got the version. I got to hear that, man. Yeah, you got to so, get that to me. Yeah. So, I mean, that was the original sitting sideways. Yeah. I never would have knew that, bro. Yeah, That's good stuff. Talk to Kiki, be like, man. Oh, I, I got it. I'm about, I'm about to get him back on Boss Talk. Just be like, Toe Down told me you was on the original sitting sideways. And, and he'll tell you. He was on that thing. Yeah. What do you think about, about uh, Toe Down? You, you you be working. <laughs> <laughs> you be using your head, too. Listen. I, I got to mess with you about Pow Wow, man. Like, when he you being the only white guy that was rapping, then you see Pow Wow come on the scene. What when did, when did you first see him, and what did you think about him? Uh, the first time I saw Paul Wall was at an in-store. And for those that don't know what an in-store is, we used to have these things called CD stores where they actually had CDs, and they used to sell music that way. <laughs> Uh, and he was at an in-store signing autographs and uh, rolled up on him, said, what's up? Dap, hug, hey man. Had you ever, you hadn't heard of him? You had heard of him before, right? Uh, I had heard him and Chameleon Air. I'd heard them both together. And, oh, the color changing click. Yeah, and see, Mad Hatter, he used the same 
person to do the art as we had. His name was Black Cat. Okay. And so Mad Hatter had signed Paul Wall and Chameleon Air under his label, the okay. Color Changing Click. So we got to hear a lot of that music before it even dropped. And so I had heard Paul rap and Paul spit, and I, I thought he was going to blow up, you know? Um, we were two different people, though. Paul Wall is grills and, you know, I'm coming down in my slab and... <laughs> <laughs> I'm cool with all that, but that's just that's just not me 100%, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's two different, you know, it's it's two different things. Is it, it the way y'all was raised in two different places? Like he yeah. on the south side of where, where no, well, he on uh well, he says on 59 South Lee, but he's South actually on the, he's actually on the north baby, side. Baby, I live, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I live with, yeah. But you know, South Lee, baby, but, I live. Listen, I'm in the heart of Southwest Houston, Texas, right? I'm at Hillcroft and West Belford, and it don't get no more Southwest. You can ask Fondren Flip. That's one street away from Hillcroft. Wow. Yeah. So listen. Uh, the whole Paul, Paul Wall and I never had any animosity. We did songs together. We worked together many times. I'm so time, glad. And it was never a, 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 oh, no, it was another white boy in the game. It wasn't that. Every white rapper that I got to meet, I tried to embrace. You know, because the more of us, it won't be so, oh, there's a white guy rapping. When right? I first had Paul Wall, I thought he was black. <laughs> I, I know how that feels. I'm sometimes. being real. <laughs> like, he, like, like he really was like I. And when I seen him, it was a delight because he he loved bro. Like ever since I met him, it's always been big love with me and Power. When I met him in Vegas, when I hung out with him, you see the pictures on the wall somewhere. But love, bro. Like and but but when I first heard him, oh man, yeah. I was like, man, this dude dope, man. And to hear him and Chameleon out together, oh boy, it was something special. You well, heard him. There's a rumor. There's a rumor that they're making another album. Get out of here. Boy, if that happens, boy, I'm going to be the happy. Boy, Boss Talk going to go crazy. I'm telling you Let right me tell now. you something. I love Chameleon right and here. I love Paul Wall, bro. You heard it right here on Boss Talk. There's a rumor. There's a rumor that Chameleon and Paul Wall are dropping another album. If they drop another album, it's going to go crazy for Texas. I don't know about nowhere else. Yeah, so tag Paul Wall on this post. And I love that boy, toe man. Down, toe down doesn't leak to that. <laughs> <laughs> toe down doesn't been messy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, it's rumored rumor. out. It's a rumor, but yeah. But I still want that. It's to a rumor. Happen. So you haven't heard any of the music. I haven't heard any music yet. But yeah. you, it's a rumor. It's I sure rumor. hope it happens. But that's the color changing click. Ain't that thing gonna go crazy? Yeah. Do you know, man? Listen, man. When I first I'm heard in them boys, with my money, ooh, the boys went so hard. Swangers I still, get, it swangers. still sounds like it' supposed to come out today. You can hear it right now. It's gonna be their time. Their and chameleonaire, man. To hear him even just do anything, we he done been so quiet. That's gonna go crazy. He's a businessman. Yeah, he saw an opportunity to get him, a, you know, some more money in a different sector. And he attacked it full force. And hats off to that guy. That guy is just a, an awesome businessman. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Love that dude, man. Let's talk about the, the when he, you know, he's in the, what Let you me into. Let me ask you <laughs> about, so where did the name Dope Heads, when did that come out? Because before when you was doing Sax for Tracks, you weren't under that name. Not even close. Um, back then, you know, if you were called a Dope Head, I'm like, what's wrong with that dude? You know, it's a dope head. That's all my, like, that is a, a, a crackhead. Right? right. Man. That's but, but just as things become part of culture, it's now a, almost a badge of honor, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I'd always been a dope head. I always called myself the Pope of Dope, right? Really? All right. You know, I, I always had the fire sack. I always had the best drugs. I was just that guy. To, I got my name towed down because one night I was so messed up. I was like, man, I'm fucking towed down. Mm, and they were like, that's, that's what I was wondering. And that's wow, your name. that's, and that's hard. How, and that's how it stuck. And so how the dope heads came about is uh, my last six months in prison, um, President Obama had signed into law that if you were a nonviolent drug offender on a federal case, you could apply to get 10% off your time. Right. If I, had I applied, remember that. If I had applied for that, that means I was going to be at the door and I could go home. Mm -hmm. I applied for it. I didn't hear for months. Didn't know if I got it or not. Finally, I get a call, toe down, you were accepted, uh, you're at the door. I think you got like three weeks left. You know, you're going home. Mm -hmm. And right then and there, you know, I knew I was leaving behind some talented people, some great storytellers, some great artists, some 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 good people, right? And I was thinking to myself, why am I only getting the 10% off? Why not all these other people get 10% off? 
So I told my brother when I came home, whatever we did, I wanted to make sure it had a social cause where we could give back, where we could do something for the people that we left behind. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of this social cause was there. And the idea for the dope heads, uh, the cartoon had been floating in my brain for, you know, five, 10 years. Like, I got to do this when I get home. I got to start doing the merch. I got, you know, all lined up. And so when we put together the idea with the animated series, we're like, all right, now let's attach the social cause to it. Because I'd read about this guy who sold shoes, and I think it's like Tom's Shoes or something. And mm -hmm. whenever you buy one pair of Tom's Shoes, he gives away two pairs yes, of shoes he does. to somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's awesome. And that blew up like crazy for at one point. Everybody because now, was if it. people can identify with what you're doing, mm -hmm. how many people in your immediate family do you know that's been incarcerated? Mm -hmm. Everybody lot. knows somebody that's been affected by mm -hmm. this drug war. Enough is enough. Like these draconian sentences, like you get a, listen, I pled out to conspiracy because all my other charges carried a mandatory 10 years. Mm. The only one that didn't have a mandatory minimum was pleading out to conspiracy. So I pled out to conspiracy to grow and manufacture marijuana. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it was a way for us to say, hey, listen, here's an idea. It's dope heads helping dope heads. Let's do an animated series where we can get the community involved in the actual production and development of the series where we can release an NFT and you can now take ownership of your favorite animated character. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you could have bought Bart Simpson the very first mm -hmm. time you saw Bart. Wow. Or imagine or Barbie. Or Barbie or Cartman. Imagine if you could have owned them, right? So I was like, well, let's sell NFTs, make them the characters. Now the people that own these characters, they can audition the character if they want to, to be a part of the show. Or they can just sit back and get an executive producer credit and just, you know, wait for the series to come out and, you know, make your money that way. And so the idea of NFTs and an animated series and a social cause, they all came together at the exact same time. And so January the 5th, we sold out of our season one NFTs. We sold a mm. thousand NFTs. Wow. And we've been rocking and rolling ever since. So now we're in pre-production. You know, I thought creating an animated series would be similar to music production. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's Find, a lot harder. Find a track, get a rapper, record it. You got a song in 24 hours, right? Okay not even close to animation. You gotta develop a log line. You gotta develop a treatment. You gotta come up with a script. You have to rewrite the script multiple times. Mm -hmm. wow. after, after you write the script, now you gotta do character development. You gotta draw each character out. You gotta draw their expressions out. You gotta develop all these things before you can even create the storyboard. Mm -hmm. Then you take the storyboard and you attach it with the vocals and now you have an, uh, an animatic, animatic mm -hmm. which then you take to an animation company that wow. animates the thing for you. So it's an ensemble of people that I, here I am thinking, I'm a one man ass kicking band. I do it all myself. <laughs> I can do it now. Well, it don't matter. I got the Man, look at here. I've called out, man. You know anything about animation? Man, you know anything about these networks, man? What? Tell me about Tubi again. Roku's paying what? Tell me about the. Uh, all day long. So the idea is there, and people love the idea. We have uh, a rap vehicle, and you will see people on the, on the highway trying to take Video. a selfie driving next to us <laughs> in the vehicle so they you know i'll be at the gas station airing up my tires or pumping gas and they'll come up to me what is that you know animated series here man check it out. oh this is dope is it out yet no it's not out but we have an intro video and we have a mini episode and we're coming with some heat you so know? when do you think you'll be able to get it completed and be out delivered i'm trying to do it in less than nine months so i got um I got a lot of the pre-production done already. We have episodes one and two already written. So now it's time for character development, getting the initial characters down. Once we do that, like I said, we can develop storyboard and the animatic and go from there. But, but if you're taking so long to do it, um, and you only have uh, episodes one and two, um, after one and two finish, will that give you enough time to 
create three and four and so forth yeah, to be so, so right as, after it? So as of right now, I just signed a co-production deal for a development of TV shows. Okay. And we have access to the major cable networks and a lot of streaming platforms to do developmental content. And so what we do is we create a sizzle reel, our character reel, deliver it to the network executives and they can order pilots or a season. What usually happens is they'll ask us, what's the budget for the season? Then they'll give us 10, 15% and say, go create the pilot. Mm. After the pilot, that's when they ordered. So instead of cutting myself short with just one pilot, let me get these two down together. Right. And then when I bring the whole thing to the network, they can see what it is. The community's already there. We're already- See the numbers exactly, come back. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, we have 9,000, 10,000 people on our Instagram, 5,000 people in our Discord. 5,000 people are on Twitter. We've only been around a year. The buzz is just building every day. Everywhere we go, people want, you know, the stickers, the air fresheners, the merchandise. So we can't mm -hmm. keep merchandise. Like, mm -hmm. I wanted to bring y'all, you know, a whole box of shirts, but we just got a shirt or a shirt order for 4,200 short shirts wow. for all the Bahama Mama location. So, wow. yeah, so. Uh, shout out to Bahama Mama. Uh, That's cool. So be looking for your dope head apparel inside the Bahama Mama mm -hmm. smoke shops and all their affiliates. And so, you know, it's a constant, you know, cat and mouse game. It's like, all right, we're handling merch today. All right, tomorrow's animation. All right, tomorrow we're rebuilding the websites. It's always a constant uh, evolution of this. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that the animation is as great as the idea and concept itself. Because the idea and concept itself is just solid. And so I didn't want to put anything but my best foot forward and moving with the dope heads. And so that's why I'm trying to make sure I got the best animators on the team. The ideas mm -hmm. that we have is the dope heads are a 2D animation, but when they get high, they go into 3D. Wow. So now we're blending 2D wow. and 3D together. That's dope. Right? So again, the idea has to be as tight as the initial concept mm -hmm. itself. People eat with their eyes, right? That's true. Make it visually stimulating. Mm -hmm. You know, when people see the stickers, they automatically know what it is. Oh, this is a weed head. Oh, this is a mushroom head. Oh, wait a minute. This is a drink head. This is tight, man. We're, you know, and it's off and running there, right? And so we are able to create this, uh, um, this this hype behind this brand and really turn it into something bigger you know it's south it's houston influence it's texas influence scarface wants to be a part of it devin the dude flavor flav uh the uh, the mexican ot i mean lil flip everybody i've That's turned i said hey man would you mind voicing it? and before i could even finish just tell me what you need to so it's just that's a true love, lesson. man. Yeah, and then you already have those relationships, so that's good. Yeah. But I know when you got um, arrested for a conspiracy, how old were you? Um, I had just turned. I had just turned thirty. Okay. Was and was that the first time you ever got in trouble? Oh yeah, yeah. I was a good boy. <laughs> let me. Let me well, let me I, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you. You know, Jeezy said, don't stop thugging until the feds come get you, right? Uh. <laughs> uh, so I had two state cases prior for that, but they were the exact same thing. Oh. They first busted me while I was at the MTV VMAs. Mm -hmm. uh, they raided my house. I come back home and all my stuff's just out of whack. Um, my second arrest was because my brother had a 6,700 square foot estate. Mm -hmm. it, it, when you sent it to me, it said four million. That's a lot, because I had one guy on here. Um, man, what's his name? The one from Detroit. You don't remember. Mm -hmm. um, man, he, he, he got busted for three million, I believe it was, in marijuana. And I can't remember his name, and that's sad. He, but the four million, that was on the third time when they arrested you. Right, so. I wanna hear about this, cause I, I'm, I'm four million is a lot, bro. And I wanna see how they came up with the calculation not, for it's you. Not, it's not that a lot when we start to talk about it. And we'll, and we'll talk about it. So okay. this is how it works out. Marijuana, when you grow it, it takes time. And we could grow a crop in 99 days. So that means we could roughly get four harvests a year, okay? That's just one house. In order for me to have a crop come down every week, I need 12 houses separated a week apart. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that means every week I'm bringing down 25 pounds, right? 
My brother, he would like to wholesale it for four thousand a pound, bring him his cash, he gonna liquidate it. Mm. Me, I like to sell quarter pounds. At the time I was doing for fourteen hundred. So no problem. Like fifty six hundred a pound all day long. So four sacks out of a pound, I'm good. So a hundred thousand, hundred and twenty thousand dollars a week, basically what it came out to be. And so we'd come down with 20 to 25 pounds, just like clockwork every 12 weeks. Uh, when I got busted the first time, that was only one grow house. That was my personal house. That wasn't included. That wasn't even the bigger one. Wasn't even included. They thought we took my weed and took it over to my brother's house, but that was far from the truth. My brother's house was going and growing before my house was, <laughs> you know, but he just had a larger estate. He. We were able to do 25 lights in his house. We were only able to do nine lights in my house. So you're doing all of this at the house that you live in. Right. And with weed, when you're planting weed, doesn't that like smell it like does. everywhere? But so there's things to combat that. So you take a charcoal filter and they're five foot charcoal filters and you put a fan, uh, an industrial fan on top and it sucks the atmosphere and it basically cleans the air through a charcoal mm. filter. So I'm pumping fret because what plants need is what we expel, right? Mm -hmm. We expel carbon, they produce oxygen. Mm -hmm. So they need to breathe clean air. And so what we would do is we would put CO2 in the atmosphere to bring in the carbon, and then we'd have to exchange the oxygen out of the air so that they could breathe properly. Otherwise, you have a stale environment, the plants aren't breathing, and they're, they're alive just as much as you and I are. So you, you know? are manufacturing top quality. Oh, the best, the best. I got my seeds from Cannabis Cup winners out of the back of the High Times magazines. Really? I germinated them myself. I grew the seeds myself. I, I, I did the mom plants myself. At the time of my brother's arrest, we had 25 different strands that we were working with. And wow. we we're trying to find, the reason we had so many is because we were trying to find the right strand that would maximize in a four foot indoor growing space. You don't want a real tall plant in a place you're growing indoors, right? And you don't want a super bushy plant, right? Because it, it, won't, it won't grow tall enough. So you gotta find the right plant, the right hybrid. And for us, it was either Sweet Tooth 3, AK-47, or White Widow, or most of the Indicas. Because what we could do is we could maximize each inch of that grow room. I could put a hundred of the same exact plants the canopies would stay the same. They would all grow at the same rate. They'd be at the same height. If you're growing 25 different strands in one room, you're gonna have one that's tall right. as a tree. One so so you don't really maximize your growing efficiency at that time. So what you do is you pick one strand for that room or that environment, and you try to maximize because if you have an eight foot ceiling, the light has to hang down about a foot or two foot, and then to get the plant up off the floor, it's about another foot. So out of that eight feet, you really only have about five. Five feet mm -hmm. or four feet of growing space that you got to maximize. Obviously, the plant can't sit on top. Uh, the light can't sit on top of the plant because it it's going to burn it. Exactly. So um, I had been growing marijuana, you know, experimentally all my life. And when you talk about hybrid, when people think about because nowadays we have so many different strands and they cut into, is that still natural? Because anything that's just like we talk about grapes, seedless grapes, that's manufactured, that's made, like that's not good yeah, for you. GMO and stuff like right. that. Right, so where weed is concerned with people um, doing things to it that's not natural, it, how so do you? So I, wasn't, I mm -hmm. wasn't dissecting the weed that way. What I would do is I'd take two great weeds that I like. The last strand and that I worked. two. Yeah, I was working with, um, the precursor to OG Kush, which is mm. called Kim Dog Number no. Five. Oh, so I took Kim okay. Dog Number no. Five and White Widow, and I I I bred them together to mm -hmm. produce some seeds. Out of those seeds, I would then create a plant where I could do a mother plant, mm. where I could then clone off that one plant. So we never genetically modified anything. Okay, we just took the best of this world and the best of that world and brought them together. A lot of people are doing that though. Well, you know, it's to weed is just the medicine that needs to be out there and everybody needs to know about it it can make you feel um creative it can cure depression it can take care of your uh people who don't have an appetite um it can do a lot of things for you uh, it's 
it's one of the only medicines out there that is a cure-all almost for everything. I used to have a lady and she would buy an ounce a week, $550 from me every week like clockwork. And I asked her, hey, what do you like smoking? Do you like smoking out of a bong, a paper? She said, I don't smoke it. I grind it up, I make a paste, and I rub it on my arthritis. Mm. And that was the first time I was when like, was, when was What year was that? Uh, 2007, Before CBD and all yes. that wow. stuff came in. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's, that's live, man. So, uh, yeah, it was Street Lord Rook. That's who got busted for millions. Mm. Uh, for millions. They, yeah. But it, it, it's, it's crazy. How did they estimate that? Like, I, I still want to understand So that. So, if what they do is they do it by gram, right? They think $25 a gram. 448 you know grams in a pound they're multiplying it by the gram right they're trying to put the most amount on you because whether you're in a fed case or whatever the amount is what they're trying to increase right the more the more of a sentence i can give you but what was a big difference in our federal and our state case was what's the definition of a plant the federal government recognizes a marijuana plant of being a root a stem and a leaf mm -hmm. in the state they only consider smokable content so oh, the just leaves. the bud so what they did in my state case is they went and they cut all the weed off the plant mm. what they didn't know was at that time we had just gone into bloom and there was no buds on the plant mm. so they <laughs> thought they had 50 pounds of weed but when they came down to the testing of it there's less than two ounces Wow. So they basically had to let us walk on a state case. Well, that wasn't cracking in their book. So they called their old, they called their the older feds. brother up and mm -hmm. they're like, hey, this guy's out here acting an ass. He's courtside at all the games. He's driving <laughs> around in his 600 bins. He just bonded out twice. This dude just really getting over on us. And that's when enough was enough. And that's when the feds stepped in. And at my federal arraignment, I'll never forget, they're describing this menace to society, this threat to this community, a danger to his friends and family. And I'm looking at my brother, I'm like, man, that sounds like a bad motherfucker. We gotta meet him. <laughs> and he says, stupid ass, they're talking about you. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, we're in a different ball game. Mm. And that's when I knew I was gonna do some time. Wow, mm. so so when you, when I seen the clipping, it was a news clipping where they came to your house mm -hmm. and it's four million and it's crazy. So you telling me at that time you wasn't even understanding what was going on? No, because I had an appetite for the lifestyle, right? Um, I knew I was going to prison at some point. My brother didn't, he, he was a smart one, right? His job was to keep his little brother out of prison, right? And my dad was like, you couldn't do anything? I was like, nah, I couldn't do anything. He said, it's like, it's like trying to drive a boat from someone jet skiing. Our, our skiing behind the boat. He said, I, my lifestyle was so onto that level of trying to impress people that really didn't matter, you know, going to the clubs and popping bottles and being around my peers and doing, I was thugging. The people that were rapping about it weren't necessarily thugging. All the stuff I talk about, my raps, you can check out. It's in a federal indictment. It's in a state indictment. There's a thing called a discovery. You can look at it. It's there, you know. So my appetite for the glamour life, it was just, you know, come on. Why buy the 550 when you can get to 600? Ooh, you know what, what I'm saying? What year did you go to prison and what year did you get out? So 2007, 2007 to 2011. Okay, so you yeah. didn't, you didn't just. It, yeah, I, they, I did. I did five years and four months. Wow, and and so and that and that Obama thing, it helped you out a lot. Man, God's grace. How long would you have done if, if that? Eighty-seven hadn't... months. Okay, so you eighty-seven did... months. Yeah, when that judge, uh, I had Kent Schaefer as my attorney. Yeah, yeah. Jay Prince's attorney, and well, like he is so well respected. When you see him walk into a state courtroom, everybody tightens up. It, it, the man's here. The man is here. When you walk into a federal courtroom, it's a different ball game. You are on a chart. And there is levels to the chart. And depending on how many times you've been arrested and what your criminal history is, depends on what category you're in, right? And the amount of weed that you have or money or whatever they can convert, because what they do is they convert it into whatever uh, form. They'll take the money and convert it into weed. Okay. If they catch you at $100,000, they'll convert that into weed and they'll charge you with the weed, right? And you're on a chart. 
you can't move that chart. That's a guideline, right? And so if you're lucky enough to be a leader or an organizer, they're going to hit you with four more points. If you're maintaining a place of manufacturing, they're going to hit you for another two more points. So now my time just doubled because they said we're a drug trafficking organization. Mm -hmm. Organization? Have you met the seven potheads out growing weed with me? Like, <laughs> for real? Like, we couldn't even meet at the same time every day. Organize? Man, really? Like, I can't even tell the dude, make sure you water first thing in the morning. When the lights come on, you can't be watering mid-afternoon. Like, it's too yeah, hot. Like, for real? Like, bro, you killing me. Like, man, you came down with how much? And they came down with, why is they coming down different from you? We got the same recipe, the same plant. You should be hitting your mark. Three pounds of light. Like, what's the Organize. My brother, he's the most organized person on the whole entire team. But to be a drug trafficking organization, we never thought You got to get gonna... everybody else on the same yeah, page. Yeah, like, wow. for real. Like, and, uh, you know, out of that situation, uh, there were seven of, seven of us got, that got arrested at the time. Mm -hmm. Only three people didn't talk. Wow. Really? It was, my, it was myself, my brother, and my other cousin. Everybody else turned. And y'all got the same amount of time? No, 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 no. How much uh, time did they get? I got the most amount of time. I got 87 months. You was my, the ringleader. Well. According to them. My brother was technically the ringleader. But the reason I got more time is because I had one more grow house on my indictment than he did. Oh. And so he was the first on the indictment. Whoever, whoever's name is first on the indictment is the ringleader. And it was his name and then my name and then other five co-conspirators. And mm -hmm. what they do is... They get the weakest person, or they find out the one right. who's, who's the weakest, and they say, hey, we're gonna attach all of Toe Down's crime onto you. So you're gonna do your time, you're gonna do Toe Down's time, and you got caught with a gun? Well, that's a mandatory five years just for that. So you're gonna do 40 years unless you give us some information we want. You don't wanna talk? Did you give your mom some money? Well, we're gonna get her for money laundering. That's the way they operate. They squeeze, police don't police, they don't go to that investigative stuff you see on TV. They find somebody, they squeeze the weakest link, and that's how they get the indictment. That's why they got a 97% conviction rate. It's not because they're doing police work, it's because someone's telling. Snitching. And then what they do is they say, hey, listen, we'll give you two points off your sentence if you go ahead and accept responsibility. Well, if you accept responsibility and they know we've been hanging out together, well, you just dry snitched on me. Damn sure did. So, uh, listen, I can beat one snitch. I might be able to beat two snitches. <laughs> Hell, with Kent Schaefer, we might be able to beat three snitches. But five of them, I, I just can't. Just can't do you it. Just, you just, you're just up against the wall. How right much now. did they get y'all with, like, like that when they came and busted you? Like, did they, did, when, they, when they came in, did they kiss you red-handed? No. So, what ended up happening was on my first arrest, we knew way before then Something that was up. Well, first of all, you can only ride success for so long, right? And then you're just playing the odds after that. And so my brother recognized way early on, instead of paying off the houses, right? What we'll do is we'll just ride mortgages on them. And then we'll take the money and put it up for a rainy day. Instead of going buying and dropping all that money, on uh, 97000 on the bins, just go get a, a note on it, right? That way, if the feds come or state come, they want to confiscate it. Well, now you got to argue with the bank. Yeah. That's y'all's problem now. Meanwhile, you have your rainy day fund. So we knew early on from Bun, put your cars in your crib and your mom and Man, that was my boy. Like, like, we already the, knew all that was coming down the pipe. The feds in town. Like, so you could prepare your Way ahead of the game. And so my brother was so far ahead of the game. When they came in and busted us the last time, they were knocking holes in the wall to try to find the money because they had heard that my brother <laughs> stashed money in the walls. But that was only partially true. He stashed it in the AC vents, because who looks in the <laughs> AC vents, right? But he didn't put it in the AC vents. that he, he put it in the air return. So you take off the filter, and you have this huge air return, and he had built shelves in the Your air return. Your brother's wow. shelf. That's why I need him on this show. I, he needs to be on it next, next time. time. Next Let time. Let me ask you this. Like, how much money did you guys have put back when y'all had to fight this Which guy? time? The last time, the one, the, the, the one that y'all was fighting so, for your life. So every time we got arrested, we doubled down on grow houses. So if we got busted with five grow houses, we had doubled down and we'd go start 10. You think you would have quit after the first time? You can't. And the reason you can is because so many people depend on you. Yeah, right? but how much money? Um, I'll give you a story. 
we were trimming weed and we had cut down about 25 pounds of weed right and um i tell my brother hey i'm gonna meet you at the studio i got some clients i need to handle i'm gonna need about 12 of those bows do what i need to do i'm gonna go shower i'll meet you over at the studio he goes to the studio by the time i get to the studio all the weed's gone a hundred thousand dollars in cash in there right i say all right and I went, and I went, and we had a closet in the back of the closet, and I grabbed as much money as I possibly could, and I just stuffed it in my pockets. And I said, I'm not coming home until we spend it all. Because I knew how much my brother loved money, right? And the last thing he wants is his baby brother going there and digging in his stash, right? And three days later, hellified bender, <laughs> still had money. There was, there was only so much you could buy. There was only so many trips you could take. There's only so many clothes you could buy. There was so much. I mean, the first time we got busted, we probably had a good mill, mill, mill and a half put away. By the third time we were busted, I don't know, maybe two or three million put away. Wow. Yeah, but you also got to remember, as a dope boy, you really don't start working until you get locked up. That's when you put your time in, right? Really? All those days you've been out there hustling, it's easy come money, it's easy, it's easy, it's easy. The day you put in work is when you get locked up. That's, That's right. when you clock in 24 hours a day and you go put your time in. And the generation that my brother and I grew up on is, we're not gonna give anybody our time. If you did it, that's on you, right? And he explained to everybody that after the second time we had gotten bop, popped, he was like, hey, listen, there is a great chance of us getting busted again. Do you understand that there are going to be repercussions if it comes down the pipeline? And at that point, we had made all our friends millionaires. You know, wow. every year on just one house, you can make about 300 grand on one house. And so we had been doing this 10, 12 years. Wow. And so it was just one of those things that our friends, we had made millionaires. But as you start to do your sentence, things happen. Hey, listen, mom, she had a stroke dad passed away mom needs money to repair the house uh your cousin needs uh money for the funeral and nobody's uh, looking out for them who's gonna look out for him all the friends that you no, listen no, people, no. people will talk that game and i'm, I'm your i'm your homie i'll ride with you listen That's i don't worry i got work. you I don't work. listen prison works like this when you get locked up your first month everybody's writing you yep. you're calling everybody yep. everything's good six months later it's half of those people it's over. Mm -hmm. a year from them it's it might be your core family might be two years from them everybody gone everybody gone everybody gone everybody, can everybody say is they, gone they but gone. but let, let me just let, okay how much was that your was, what was your biggest transaction like, like you, you, you talked about the hundred thousand that you did, brother. But that wasn't your biggest. What was the biggest transaction? I remember getting on a plane. Give me the whole story. I remember getting on a plane and going to California, and I brought my own weed that I grew, right? And I wanted to source uh, a supplemental weed because we had twelve houses already, and when you think about it, that's only twenty five pounds a week. Well, if I got five guys and they're each moving five pounds a week. That's only five guys moving five pounds a week. There's still another 10 guys I got to serve, mm -hmm. right? So I need other weed that's just as good as mine to supplement. So get on a plane. I got about 400,000 cash. I'm going to get some weed from California. I'm put on the plane with me. I'm going to take it back to Houston. I must have visited probably 15 or 20 farms, and nobody can come close to the stuff that I was doing. The... The stuff that I was doing was indoor, it was quality, it was controlled. I can manipulate the color of the plant. If you wanted purple weed, I could freeze the plant out and I could deliver purple weed. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to taste a certain way, I could supplement the taste. Mm. We were that far in the game with the stuff. So and you would think that California would have had, cause that's where- They do have great weed, but it's mainly outdoor. And so mm -hmm. you can instantly tell outdoor from indoor by oh, the color okay. of the green, right? Mm. Something that doesn't- It's darker see, or lighter. Well, and indoor's lighter because it doesn't receive that direct sunlight mm -hmm. that makes it harden off, that gives it that deep red emerald color mm -hmm. so it's almost like a lighter albino-ish green if you would so it's which a lighter better. color huh which is better i like indoor why uh, 
it stays out of the elements. There's nothing that replaces the sun. Exactly. Right? They do stuff now where uh, they do something where it's kind of like indoor, but it's outdoor. It's called light deprivation, and that's where they take a, a retractable roof. And they basically open the roof during the day and then they close, close it, right? And that's probably a little bit better, but just something that, see, indoors, I can take the environment and I can increase the CO2 in that environment to make the plants basically be on steroids. Mm -hmm. Now I can produce a thicker, more heavier plant. So it's all about the production. It's not about the correct. taste or texture. It's, both of them will still have the same. Well, yeah, but... The taste comes from and the highs. actual plant itself, right? Mm -hmm. If you start off with good genetics, I can supplement and put sugar into it to make it a little bit sweeter, right? I can make sure that uh, when I go through my last couple weeks and I just do fresh water and I can cleanse the plant out of all the nutrients, I can bring a good taste into it. I can bring taste if I do a longer cure period where I'm curing the plant for a longer period, you know, at a, at a uh, cooler temperature, right? Mm -hmm. So taste can be developed different ways, but it all starts with the strand, mm -hmm. how good that strand is. Once you have a good strand, then you can build off that. So really I've smoked good outdoor weed that's just as good as indoor. I just prefer the indoor because I can control you know exactly the environment, what. right? So let me wow, ask so you about this real quick. Because you brought us some goodies. Brought you a whole bunch of goodies. Man, we got them. And I tried this. <laughs> we got them. And it tastes really good. But I'm, I'm not feeling nothing yet. Get you another one. <laughs> <laughs> but you said you eat edibles, though. Yes. So please have another one. See, you know what to expect. You know it's coming down the pipeline. Right? It's coming. Right. Uh, it's coming down the know, pipeline. You know, there's enough in there to get you feeling good. But like I said... One will make you feel good. Two will get your toe down. Try another one. I will try an, another one because this one don't have me feeling good yet. But that, but I will say it, it is an empty can there. So <laughs> yeah, so I did thing. drink so, it all up. Yeah. Man, she toe did, down. She, she did and drink the what else? Do, what else so, you have here? So basically, we have the Houston Juice, which I'm sponsored by Houston mm -hmm. Juice. And we're coming out with our own toe down juice within the next six weeks. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get the Houston Juice, hit me up at toe down it's toe dot down on instagram mm -hmm. or at dope heads nft and i can plug you in with the houston juice um the other is the dope heads right we have the rolling papers we have the air fresheners we have the merchandise all that can it be it smells good too it don't smell like weed or none of that stuff <laughs> all, smells good. all that can be purchased from our website and our store you can uh follow us through our link tree on dope heads nft uh, at Dopeheads NFT, um, and we're just super easy to find, you know. Wow. Um, I, I, my biggest question is, with you guys having so much, much experience and with 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 marijuana and with CBD and all the stuff becoming so, you know, open and upfront, are you guys gonna get into the business? As far as you know what I mean, as far well, as that's far as growing, growing and, them again and, and, and all that. Like, like you got what's, what's the other myself. one name? Uh, uh, huh? The one, uh, the the ones I cookies and all these guys, so they this uh, is, uh, big chief. That's AD just left here. They they rolling, man. So this is what we've done. We've teamed up with Mellow Fellow, mm -hmm. and they are the big dog in the game. Okay, right? They are the creme de la creme. They are the premier brand. You know, their products are unrivaled against anybody else. Really? Right. And they can ship in every state except for California. And they have different flavors. Different flavors, uh, different uh, forms of THC from everything from THCA, THCV. I mean, there's so many things that THC can do now. And we're talking about real flour. We're not mm -hmm. talking about, you know, a spray or this or that. So Mellow Fellow and myself have teamed up to do a cross promotion with the dope heads. Wow. And so when you want something that's as high quality as the Houston juice or as, you know, my products have been known for in the past, Mellow Fellow is the brand that we're teaming up with to bring you that experience. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you bring a lot of experience to the table. So making that deal with Mellow Fellow to, to partner up with you, did they take in consideration all of the, your experience? Well, you know, I don't, I can't compete with their their lab and their tech. Of course, by far. of course. But you know. But you bring a reputation to the game. 
and just as music and marijuana have a symbiotic relationship, mm. toe down <laughs> and dope heads <laughs> and, you know, uh, THC have a symbiotic relationship. Right. So just like if you're looking for a good hamburger, you know to go to Trill Burger. Trill Burgers, exactly. man. Just like if you're looking for a nice, high quality product, you're going to come mess with Toe Down and Mellow Fellow. Mellow Fellow is going to get you to the place where you need to be every time. And not only that, but there's different there's different flavors. There, If you want to be creative, uh, if you want to relieve some anxiety, everyone is, is it's different. Oh, so they're for different things. Yeah. So it depends on yeah, what you, exactly, and what you, oh, exactly. okay. You want more of a euphoric effect. I gotta read the back. You want more of a euphoric effect, everything. So the way it kind of breaks down like this is, you know, the the weed house, I'm gonna mm -hmm. break it down like this. You can walk into the door, right? And inside this weed house, there's different THC rooms, THCV, THC uh, A, all different types of rooms in THC. So we're just starting to explore the different THCs that are out there. And due to the uh, farm bill that was passed, you know, because it's a hemp product and it is THC, we're able to distribute it through every state except for California. Wow, mm. man, congratulations on figuring it out. Well, listen, I've had, I have great partners in Mellow Fellow uh, ever since day one that I've teamed up with them. They've always you know, blessed me with, hey, listen, try this out. This is what we're trying to pu uh, push out there right now. Tell us what your feedback is. And I'll give them on, you know, an honest feedback because mm -hmm. I didn't believe that you know something that was legal could make me feel this way, wow. could make me feel this good or equal to what I'm used to. Yeah. And I was dead wrong. Wow. I mean, not only better, but I mean, top quality. Um, I think one of those sells for like, I think $69. Wow. wow. Right. So we're talking quality. And I mean, everything from flour to the vapes. Uh, How to, long would a pen last? It lasts me about a month. That long? Yeah. Oh. Because I'm not constantly charging on it. I might okay. once, twice, and I'm putting it down because it's such high quality. You know, if you have to go back and go, yeah, what quality is that? Unless right. you just like the flavor, right? Mm -hmm. Those flavors are great, but you only need one or two, and that's mm -hmm. it. Wow. So um, the next thing I wanted to know, since you were arrested and convicted f for a conspiracy where, you know, weed and all of that is concerned, if Texas ever become legal, right? Um, would you be eligible to, to go into that business or no because the federal government says that marijuana is a scheduled one narcotic which means it has the same evaluation as heroin and crack the federal government says that marijuana has no medical value now, 27 states said that they have medical value. Yeah, then how is it legal then in certain states? Because what happens is you have different levels of, I'm gonna break you back to social studies class. Mm -hmm. So you have different levels of the government, right? You have your local, you have your city, you have state. your state, and you have the Federal. feds, mm -hmm. right? And so the states can have their individual laws, right? Mm -hmm. As long as they don't conform with the federal government right but what happens is if a state has voted for recreational marijuana it's very difficult for the federal government to charge somebody with a marijuana crime in that state exactly because they can't find a jury to convict because they voted it in exactly by majority so the majority of the people that are going to be on that jury have already voted for marijuana <laughs> in that state, which is that's why those states aren't, you know, being pressed by the federal government. If the federal government really wanted to shit on everybody, they could go in and close all those stores, all those stores down immediately. Right. That's not going to happen. The states have voted. Hey, we believe in marijuana. It should be recreational or it should be, you know, licensed and we should be able to, you know, smoke it and enjoy it. The problem is, is that if big pharma right understood all the capabilities of what marijuana is that's the reason they've been lobbying against this the whole time the number one supporters of the drug war and all that is anheuser bush and these people because what's happening is that's breaking into their market mm -hmm. the pharmaceutical industry the same way mm -hmm. so the pharmaceutical industry if they knew you could grow all your medicine in your backyard for less than five dollars they'd be out of business mm. oh no you can keep going oh so you know <laughs> that's what i would love to be the jim bean of marijuana and do my own strand and come out and do all that stuff again but until the federal government says that it's not a schedule one narcotic i'll be a mellow fellow representative 
Wow. You know, next best thing. I think I think, man, like I said, this has been the greatest interview, man. Um, I, I knew it was going to be exciting, man. But you definitely, like I said, uh, just to hear your story and the, the things that you the challenges and then to be so culturalistically, you know, involved with what we, you know, love is music, man. I think that's dope, bro. Like, like I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, you embody uh, uh, just uh, the Texas thing. The Pimp C thing got you all the way in with me anyway. <laughs> You ain't have to worry about it. You you straight up welcome to Boss Talk One Hundred and One anytime you feel like calling me up. Cause well, listen, bro, I listen to PMC stories. That's what this show is built up. Well, around. next time I can get my brother on hill, he'll tell you even more stories about. Really? Me. Yeah, he's he goes deep. He's got some Willie D stories that blow your mind. Really? Yeah, he's truly a character all in his all in itself. But listen, Boss Talk is a staple in our household wow we listen to it all the time we wow enjoy it. it's a staple in texas you man. know there's no better representative of our state than you guys man we oh, love really. it man and i appreciate y'all giving me the opportunity of being here bring in my brands and my support you know check out Houston gotta check Jews. it out check out mellow fellow check out the dope heads if you have any questions call me you can call me on the phone uh i leave everything open if you want to reach me on instagram it's toe.down t-o-w.down you can reach me on the dope heads at dope heads nft and like, like i said you can just reach out and call me it's all good top three artists of all time dead or alive man you got if you watch boss talk 101 you know that's any what we genre. do any genre top three artists of all well, time i got the first dead one in, or alive. i got the first let's one in, go i got the first one and two for you right now you got pimp scene you got bun b hey yeah. man i love it boy man. you don't even know boy you, you could have kept hey. UG, you could have said ug hey. is number no, one say no. listen man no. love it bro no. love it listen no. the show that's tell and them I'm ask about not, that. I'm just even gonna say number three. I'll just go. I'll just go ahead and throw Tupac in there just for names. Wow, man! You see this guy? This guy right here can come on Boss Talk every day. Y'all don't even realize what's going on over here, man. I, I like I said, I'm gonna always get you back on the show. You don't even realize. I it, got man. a quick question. Sure. Because I was being nosy and looking through the um, Mellow Fellows, right? Right. And I saw one that says Clarity. Right. But I see one that says Desire. So what is that supposed to do? Well, you know, I want to say it's the Viagra for smokers, but <laughs> you need to just need to check it out. Mellow Fellow, it's in your local Bahama Mamas. Uh, Bahama Mama is a very successful smoke shop. Um, you can also uh, check it out online. It's at mellowfellow.com. But yeah, Mellow Fellow, Bahama Mamas, mm -hmm. where you can buy them. Check them out. They'll be carrying all the toe down merch along with you guys. Yes, sir. So uh, we going to do listen, it. Dope heads and toe down are invading soon. So if you don't know, now you know. You Now you know, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show, man. My You've pleasure. already told everybody how they can get a hold of you yes. and reach yes. out, man. I just want to thank you again, man, for coming on the show. Me and my wife, we was excited about this. And hey, man, it was everything I thought it was going to be, man. What? Toe down, been on Boss Talk 101. What a boss is talking. Y'all better stop playing, man. It's Holla. a wrap. And we out.